I ask uh, the public leaving the gallery to do so quietly as the Parliament is still in session. The next item of business is a member's business debate on motion 7165 in the name of Richard Leonard on the importance of worker ownership to the Scottish economy. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Would those members who wish to speak in the debate please press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on Richard Leonard to open the debate. Mr Leonard, seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. What we face today is a state of affairs in which we are witnessing a growing centralisation and a growing concentration, and I would argue a growing over-concentration in the ownership of Scotland's economy. Too much power rests in too few hands, and increasingly this power rests in boardrooms thousands of miles away, with over a third of Scotland's economic and industrial base now overseas owned. Now, there is nothing intrinsically wrong with foreign direct investment. It can bring innovation, investment and employment, but all too often it is the result of mergers and acquisitions, including in recent years the acquisition of public utilities, which we the people used to own, a transfer of ownership rather than the source of new investment. And if our economy becomes as it has increasingly become a branch plant economy, the result is that we are more vulnerable to international shocks. The truth is that economic ownership matters because with economic ownership comes economic power. So if we are to achieve, as I believe we must achieve, a redistribution of wealth and power to the many from the few, it will require decisive action to challenge and change the ownership structure of our economy. So that is why I say it is time we put in place a Scottish investment bank worthy of the name, working as a proactive agent of economic change, investing patient capital and taking strategic public interest shares in private companies. It's time as well that we put in place different frameworks and ownership structures to build up business resilience to takeovers and to build in greater democracy and accountability in our economic system. And it has long been my view as well that in order to do this, it is time to promote direct employee and worker ownership in the Scottish economy. So I am delighted to bring this debate to Parliament today and I am delighted to have secured uh, some cross-party support so that together in this Parliament, uh, we, we can all recognise the contribution made by employee-owned companies to the Scottish economy in the present, and so that together in this Parliament we can consider the even greater contribution that worker-owned businesses could make with a bit more support from this Parliament in the future. The motion we are debating today is prompted by a recent visit I made to two employee-owned firms in East Kilbride, one now well established as a worker-owned business, one just starting out on that journey. In both cases, Klansman Dynamics and Novograph, the catalyst for the transfer of ownership was the far-sightedness of the existing owners. In each case, the owners were looking for a succession plan which did not entail selling up the business only to see the assets stripped, the order book stolen and the local jobs lost forever. These are owners, to their great credit, who believed that they had a moral obligation to the working women and men who with them had built these businesses up. So the question for this parliament is this, what can we do to put this radical idea into action more widely? Can we make this moral obligation on some a legal obligation on all? And so how can we move it from the fringes to the mainstream of our economy? And what can we learn from international experience? In Italy, the Marcora Law, introduced in 1985, gives workers whose business faces closure a statutory right to buy the company. And alongside this legal right is funding from the state to match a contribution from the workers themselves. In France, the Social and Solidarity Economy Law, passed in 2014, gives legal recognition and incentives to workers, again, to buy the business they work in when it is to be sold off. And in the Basque country of Spain, Mondragon has been a shining beacon of cooperative ownership for six decades, 
Over 83,000 workers are employed in over 250 worker-owned enterprises where surpluses are reinvested in the business rather than redistributed to absentee shareholders, with the result that during the current economic slump, jobs have been retained. So I say this this afternoon, why shouldn't Scotland, which was the home to the Fenwick Weavers, where Robert Owen wrote A New View of Society and established New Lanark, why shouldn't we set ourselves the ideal, the goal of becoming the Mondragon of the North? Let us have a vision of Scotland as a Northern European beacon of cooperation. If we can have a community right to buy land, why can't we have a worker's right to buy business? Why shouldn't those who create the wealth have a right to own the wealth that they create? And if we support this idea, whether as a statutory right of first refusal for workers when an enterprise is put up for sale or facing closure, or simply its wider promotion on a voluntary basis, it will demand a better resource and a more powerful cooperative development Scotland with access to investment, with access to technical support and with statutory underpinning from this parliament as well. There are sound industrial and, ec and economic reasons to promote worker ownership, to boost employment and to forge a sustainable alternative to footloose and speculative capital ownership. But there are underlying political and social reasons too. A century ago, GDH Cole declared that if democracy is, I quote, good in the state and local government, it is good in industry also. I believe that we need industrial and economic as well as political democracy. We can and we must build a future in Scotland based upon equality and greater common ownership because it is a future which working people all across this country all too often encountering drudgery, alienation and exploitation at work will strive for and reach out for because it is a message of hope and it is a message of change. And real hope and real change is what I believe the people of Scotland expect this parliament to deliver. Thank you very much, Mr Leonard. I call Marie Todd to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Ms Todd, please. Thank you, presiding officer. And thank you, Richard Leonard, for... Um, I'm absolutely delighted to have the opportunity to explain why we've embraced this model up in the Highlands and Islands and to talk about some of the thriving businesses that we have as a result. So Aquascot, Hebridean Jewellery, Highland Home Carers, Shetland Vets and the West Highland Free Press. I think that northern beacon that you spoke about in your speech already exists. We just all need to look north. We have two of the biggest employee-owned businesses in Scotland. Aquascot is the largest by turnover, and that's a sustainable seafood business with a turnover of 45 million, which employs around 180 people. Highland Home Carers is the largest by number of employees, so the largest provider of care at home in the Highland area, and it employs um, more than 500 members of staff. Employee ownership has a specific role to play in fra the fragile economy of the Highlands and Oil Islands. So before going down the, the employee ownership um, route at, with Aquascot, Dennis Overton had a look at the history of the entrepreneurial startup in the Highlands. So firstly, going back to 1960, there were only a few businesses that had achieved a turnover of 20 million plus at 1990 values. Secondly, most of the founders exited by way of a tra trade sale. And thirdly, the majority of businesses had disappeared, usually through consolidation with operations in the South within five years. So because of this, HIE is currently putting significant effort into raising awareness of employee ownership, and that's why I'm particularly grateful to have this opportunity to speak today. This model, make no mistake, is about successful businesses. Independent research suggests that a combination of shared ownership and employee participation delivers superior business performance. Productivity in the UK uh, workforce as a whole might be flat, but when a business becomes employee-owned, productivity is boosted by 5 to 10%, and it's sustained at that higher level. It's not just a temporary boost. Research shows that these businesses grow well, even in tough times. And at the moment, the employee-owned sector contributes 30 billion GDP to the UK economy annually. There's a lot of misconceptions about this business model. So I thought I'd take the opportunity to bust a few myths. 
Employee ownership is not necessarily about saving failing companies. It really is about successful business. Although a common reason behind becoming employee-owned is retirement, some folk do choose to do this long before retirement because of the benefits to the business and the benefits to the staff. It doesn't need to be a complex transaction. Everyone tends to be on the same side, as you can imagine, so there's less conflict and there's generally a more cooperative transition. It's not too expensive for employees to afford. If shares are bought on trust on behalf of employees, it can be funded by contributions from the company itself or by a loan that's then paid for by the company. The vendor doesn't need to sell at a lower price. So in fact, there's absolutely no reason why a carefully considered employee buyout can't deliver a fair price in line with the company's market value. One of the reasons we like this model so much in the Highlands and Islands is because it keeps profits and jobs in the local economy. Companies can protect both the location and the ethos of their business following succession. That's what happened with Highland Home Carers. The founder didn't want to see the company being swallowed up by one of the national providers and the company's core values diluted and high care standards compromised. With this business model, employees share in the profits and bonuses, which increases spending locally and boost the local economy. I personally love the egalitarian aspect that every shareholder gets the same size tax-free bonus from factory floor worker to managing director. I've mentioned Aquascot a couple of times and I'd really love it if the minister would come and visit for himself to see the, the difference that employee ownership makes. This month, they won the Highlands and that's, that's, I'm sorry, you must conclude. That's where to stop because I think he was nodding, accepting your invitation. Okay, can I just sum up saying employee ownership is good for business, it's good for the local people working in the business and it's good for the local economy. And I have absolutely no doubt in the future Scotland will be inclusive, fair and prosperous and this business model will help. And I've been more than generous giving you that little bit at the end, but well done. Uh, Jackie Bailey, I know you've got to be away sharp to something. I do. So. Thank you very much, Followed presiding by Dean officer. Lockhart. I, I will be as brief as I can, but can I start by congratulating Richard Leonard on securing this debate? Because, you know, diversity in the economy is absolutely a good thing and very good for economic growth. So let me illustrate this, because I think if all that we do in this parliament is consider the evidence, then, then here it is. Because the Employee Ownership Index compares the share price performance of companies that are more than 10% owned by their employees with the performance of FTSE companies. Mm -hmm. Now, since 1992, the Employee Ownership Index has outperformed the FTSE by an average of 10% a year. In cash terms, an investment of £100 in an employee-owned company in 2003 would have, by the time you got to 2014, resulted in a net worth of £754. That same investment in a FTSE company would have been worth a mere £280. So if you needed any more evidence than that, you know, it matters financially for our economy to invest in employee ownership. That difference is borne out in growth measures. So sales typically for employee-owned companies grew by 11.1%. Um, in contrast to the rest of the business sector, that growth was 0.6%. Productivity in employee-owned companies has increased by about 4.5% year on year, when others have clearly struggled. So whilst employee-owned businesses, I think as um, Marie Todd rightly pointed out to us, contribute 30 billion to GDP each year, I think there is so much more potential. And more potential not because it's about failing businesses, it's not. Not even because it recycles things into fragile economies, but just look at John Lewis, look at Waitrose, look at the things on our high streets that we know so well that are employee owned. And if you needed any further convincing, um, Minister, 80% of employee owners would recommend their organization as a place to work. So employee owned businesses, positive models that contribute to a growing economy. And as Richard Leonard pointed out in his motion, employee-owned businesses have grown. They're an attractive option for business succession. Employee-owned businesses build resilience into our economy. And when you transfer ownership to employees, that kind of guarantees that the new owners will take a genuine interest in the long-term future of the business. Now, I'm very proud presiding officer, that it was a Labour Scottish Government that set up Cooperative Development Scotland. And can I commend my cooperative colleagues at the time, Cathy Jimmison, Joanne Lamont, to name 
just two, um, for their efforts in this regard. Because I know that Co-op Development Scotland has done a lot to encourage employee ownership, but its profile is low. It sits within Scottish enterprise, and you know, I don't think they entirely get it. It doesn't really appear to be a priority. When you look at Scottish enterprises' focus on key growth sectors, um, five out of six of them haven't grown in the last four to five years. Now, it's not about putting all your eggs in one basket, but surely we need to encourage more employee ownership. These businesses are growing, they're productive, they contribute positively to the economy. So I want to ask the Minister what additional action he will take to provide Cooperative Development Scotland with the resources they require. Can I invite him to look at Scottish Labour's proposals in our industrial strategy that place Cooperative Development Scotland on a statutory footing and provide it with investment tools to grow employee-owned companies? And I apologise for not being able to hear his response to that challenge, but I look forward to reading it in the official report. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Dean Lockhart to follow by Andy Whiteman. Mr Lockhart, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, let me start by congratulating Richard Leonard on bringing this uh, motion and debate to the Chamber. A valuable opportunity uh, to debate uh, the benefits afforded by employee-owned businesses in Scotland. It might not come as a surprise that my views on wider economic issues diverge slightly uh, from Mr Leonard, but I'm very happy to support his motion in respect of uh, employee-owned businesses on a voluntary basis. Uh, the increasing importance of this business model has been highlighted by the Employee Ownership Association. There are 115 uh, of these businesses in Scotland. Collectively, they generate over £1 billion in turnover and employ a total of some 7,000 staff. So clearly an important uh, part of the business community. And the importance is increasing. Um, there's more interest in this business model from public and private sectors, giving uh, the, the increased demand for a more progressive form of ownership, as well as ageing populace, uh, populations and the baby boom owners looking to prepare for uh, retirement. Uh, for example, research commissioned by Scottish Enterprise suggests that there, there are 16,000 businesses in Scotland whose owners will be looking to exit within five years. And it's good that this is one of the business models that can be looked at. So there's clearly um, potential, uh, great potential going forward for a greater uptake of, of this model. And reflecting this, as Jackie Bailey said, within Scottish Enterprise, you have the um, service run by the Cooperative uh, Development Scotland arm of Scottish Enterprise working with Highlands and Islands Enterprise Board, and this service involves expert advice on how companies can transition. Uh, business owners can go in, uh, talk to the team for one to three days and get a, an understanding of how you can transition existing businesses into this model. And we would encourage any uh, business considering this model to get in touch with that team at an early stage so that um, they can make the necessary uh, preparations. Uh, research commissioned by uh, Scottish Enterprise has also identified that the performance of these companies can, in many areas, be superior to other business models. Jackie Bailey mentioned uh, the, the comparison with the FTSE, uh, but there's also strong performance in the areas of job creation, exports, and higher productivity. Uh, it's worthwhile, I think, to step back and, and consider uh, why do these businesses have uh, a better per performance than some of their peers? And research has indicated that the improved performance is driven by a number of factors, including uh, increased employee motivation. I think Richard Leonard mentioned this. Employees have a direct stake in the success of the business and feel that they are contributing to the success. Uh, higher productivity levels uh, driven by employees feeling empowered to alter and improve uh, processes on a daily basis and systems to make the business more efficient. This concept of workplace productivity is becoming uh, a central policy driver across all business models. And I think this particular business model shows you that on a relatively small scale, if, if workers are looking at a process day in, day out, they have the best ideas of how to improve that process. There's also higher levels of interaction with the local community. Employee-owned businesses tend to have more engagement with local communities and engage in a wider range of stakeholders. So any business model that can achieve any or all of these improvements has to be welcomed. John Lewis has uh, partnership and Waitrose have also been mentioned as good examples. And I was lucky to visit recently the, the Waitrose store in Stirling to really see how this can make, this kind of model can make a difference to employees and the level of engagement. 
Uh, going forward, I think one of the challenges uh, these types of businesses will face this model is the capital investment required up front to transition to the employee ownership model and also raising awareness amongst businesses and professional advisors that this is a, a, a feasible and viable option for not just succession planning, but other types of circumstances where a business can transition to this model. So to conclude, Deputy Presiding Officer, um, I think it's important to highlight the, the benefits of employee-owned business, but also to have a discussion about some of the attributes and success that these businesses have generated. The employee motivation and participation, higher levels of productivity, engagement with the local community and stakeholders are all things I think would get consensus across the chamber, uh, not just uh, in, in the context of employee-owned business, but in terms of the economy as a whole. So I'm very pleased to support Richard Leonard uh, in you. this motion. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Andy Whiteman to be followed by Eileen Smith. Andy Whiteman. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and um, thanks to Richard Leonard for bringing this uh, motion. I was particularly um, uh, uh, pleased to hear him talk about the importance of who owns the capital in our economy. It's been a topic that has not had sufficient attention in recent years, although it used to be a bigger topic of, of conversation. I will also welcome the fact that he noted that much foreign direct investment is not actually investment. It is merely transfer payments that come into this country. They don't even come into this country. They go into some other country uh, and go somewhere else. And particularly that so because so much of our uh, industry now and economy and things like whiskey uh, is now foreign owned. There's very, very little left. Uh, I think uh, Edring the Edrington Group, uh, most of the shares were handed over to the Robertson Trust, um, which so if you want to buy um, socially uh, benign, beneficial whiskey uh, by, by famous grouse. I was also a little bit disappointed um, that Richard Leonard in his, his motion talks about recognising notes, welcoming and noting. Um, I think the substance of his uh, intention to bring this debate was to promote the notion that there should be rights for labour to acquire capital. Um, those are rights that have existed in the past. There are rights that do have some precedent in this parliament and their rights, I think, that should be embedded in law. Because, as a number of uh, contributors noted, by any metric, employee-owned companies are more likely to be successful uh, than others. Uh, staff are more engaged and productive, as uh, Dean Lockhart pointed out. The business is more resilient, better links to the community, uh, etc. And it's encouraging to know that employee-owned businesses are growing at a rate of nearly 10% uh, across uh, the UK and co uh, uh, employee-owned businesses grew their sales by 11.1% through the recession compared to others which grew by 0.6%. Um, in my own constituency in, in Edinburgh here, I was very pleased shortly after being elected to be able to congratulate uh, Blacklight Limited, uh, a sound and vision company based in Granton, uh, to, to take the move into employee ownership. At the instigation of the previous owner, as Richard Leonard pointed out, they're often critical because they often have some kind of a, a sense that they want this business, that they've spent a lot of time and money uh, building up to have a sustainable future. And the most sustainable future, in many, many cases, uh, is employee ownership. And in the past one year, uh, Blacklight's uh, turnover has increased by uh, 10%. Uh, Richard might also uh, be aware that um, employee-owned uh, capital is central to green uh, thinking. Uh, in our policy passed by members at our conference on trade union and workers' rights, uh, we are committed to economic democracy, whereby undertakings shall be managed cooperatively through the involvement of those who work in them and the communities uh, they serve. We support a mutual sector as a key component of a green economy. And just two years ago, I was very pleased uh, to second a motion um, that, and I quote, we will legislate to grant private sector employees the right to buy the company for which they work, creating a cooperative. This right will be dependent on the company meeting a range of criteria, which will be subject to public consultation, which may include the size of the workforce, ethical standards such as tax compliance and pay ratios, etc. Now, as Richard well knows, um, many of these aspects are reserved to Westminster, but we already have in the frame, in Scottish legislation passed by this parliament, the community right to buy. And we've had instances last year, for example, when a major uh, estate in Scotland, the Tolkien Estate, managed to avoid the provisions of the community right to buy by selling the shares in the company rather than the land itself. And that will be the subject, I think, of a, a sale that's coming up in Aberdeenshire 
uh, very uh, soon as well, and therefore we need to revisit that legislation to, 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 to stop those avoidance tactics. But to conclude, Presiding Officer, I'm very happy, as Greens are, to work with Richard Leonard in, what, in whatever capacity he plays in Parliament to advance these notions. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Elaine Smith to be followed by John Mason. Ms Smith, please. Thank you, President Officer, and can I thank my colleague Richard Leonard for bringing this important issue to the Chamber. Richard, of course, has spent much of his working life fighting for workers' rights, and he's consistently raised workers' issues in this Chamber since his election last year. Indeed, his first members' debate was on the Caterpillar workers' occupation. President Officer, the number of employee-owned businesses in Scotland has trebled over the past five years, and it's one of the fastest-growing forms of ownership in our country, and I think it is time that we paid it more attention. Last year, actually, I launched a motion celebrating the work of specialised castings of Denny in my region of central Scotland. They're Scotland's only employee-owned foundry, and they're one of only two remaining iron foundries in the country. Um, by the owner allowing employees to buy out that company in a succession plan, that key historic industry has been kept in the area and it's been allowed to thrive. And without that option available, we would not only have seen unemployment, <coughs> but we'd have been left with having to look abroad for specialist items like this. So this is a model of ownership for other businesses across the region and the country as a whole. And as the motion notes, other companies in central region like Nova Graph and Klansman Dynamics are flourishing in a similar way. Not only is employee ownership radical and forward thinking, but it's sensible too. Because who better to advise on how to run a business or an organisation than the people who work in it every single day? President officer, but for many people, our economy just isn't working. When people are put out of work, often because of um, employer relocation or closing down, it can result in poverty, family breakdown, mental ill health, or indeed homelessness, as my committee has been hearing in our, inquiry, uh, our ongoing inquiry. And this happens to many workers without them ever having the opportunity to do anything to stop it. And that just can't be right. Richard has mentioned the Macora law, which enables workers to buy out an enterprise when it's up for sale or threatened with closure. And there are, of course, other European examples. Richard himself has personally committed to pursuing legislation to ensure that those who create the wealth have a right to own the wealth they create. And I fully support that. It makes sense to keep jobs and profits in Scotland as part of a wider industrial strategy with workers' ownership at its core. This could have dramatically changed the situation for the UCS in 1971, the workers of Lee Jeans in 1981, or Caterpillar workers in 1987. Rather than a sit-in, a work-in or a strike, workers could meet owners face-to-face, -face, decide their own futures, rather than having it decided for them by corporate greed. President officer, we should design our society with the workers who toil every single day right at the forefront. This would include profits being fed back into companies and the economy to secure jobs and build e expertise. And what better way to improve productivity and job security than to give people a financial investment in their own labour? As a socialist, I firmly believe in the principle in which Labour's 1918 constitution was founded, also known as Clause 4. And I'll just remind the Chamber of it to secure for the workers by hand or by brain the full fruits of their industry and the most equitable distribution thereof that may be possible upon the basis of the common ownership of the means of production, distribution and exchange and the best obtainable system of popular administration and control of each industry or service. Indeed, Scottish Labour's campaign for socialism, which I was the convener of um, for over a decade until last year and is now being taken over as a convener by my colleague here, Neil Finlay, was set up to retain that very clause and campaign for socialist policies to build the sound planned economy that's needed to ensure equality and social justice. We need to let workers, business owners, and especially colleagues in here, politicians, know that employee ownership is not a fantasy or a utopia. It's an everyday reality that can transform our economy in new and progressive ways. So, President Officer, Let's promote cooperatives, foster worker buyouts and teach young people about the possibilities of employee control so that we can produce wealth, not just for a tiny handful at the top, but for everyone, or in other words, for the many, not the few. Uh, I call John Mason to be followed by Jamie Halker Johnson. Mr Mason, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer, and thank you, Richard Leonard, for bringing up this very important subject, uh, and I'm more than happy to take part in this debate. I think when discussing the economy in Scotland, we've tended to focus on starting and growing businesses, but I've spent less time, as others have said, on who owns them. 
and whether it is a good or bad thing for a business to be sold. We've tended to accept that the norm is for one or two people to start a business, then to grow it to some extent, and if it can be sold off to a multinational for a sizable sum, that is considered to be a huge success, and will certainly get headlines on the back page of the Herald, if not the front. But there are downsides to this model. Often only a few people make a big profit on the sale, and control and profits, as others have also said, then go abroad, and we are left with a local branch, which is always vulnerable when a downturn comes. But as Richard Leonard has described today, there are alternatives. Clearly the best, best known example is John Lewis and Waitrose, although that's a bit bigger than your average business. I, th I thank Cooperatives UK and others for their briefings for today's debate, and they make the point that, quote, while giving employees a beneficial ownership stake in business is a very good thing, the positive impacts of doing so are maximised when the workforce also has a significant degree of collective influence in the running of their business as well, I end of quote. Now, I've seen various statistics, some have been quoted already today, on worker and employee ownership, uh, but the key ones seem to be that there's between 51 and 186 uh, employee-owned businesses, maybe 115 if it's worker-owned, 6,800 to about 7,000 workers in Scotland, and turnover somewhere between 925 million and 1 billion pounds. The research uh, does suggest, and I think Jackie Bailey quoted quite a lot of that, that worker-owned companies do outperform their competitors in employment, sales, and productivity. They have staff turnover and absenteeism, which are often less than half their sector, and are considered more trustworthy by people. 58% would trust an employee-owned business as compared to 33% uh, for others. As Cooperatives UK say, worker ownership can mean flatter pay structures and profit sharing, reduced inequalities, opportunity to develop skills, boost life chances, and improve employee, uh, sorry, empl uh, social mobility. However, it has to be accepted that these are not automatic, and I was disappointed to some extent to see that in the John Lewis constitution, the pay of the highest partner can still be 75 times the average basic pay of non-management partners. Now, I accept that 75 times may be better than some companies, but I have to say it's still not great. To, absolutely. Andy Whiteman. Thank Mr. Mason for taking intervention on that point. And it highlights the fact, I too have also studied the little green book of John Lewis, and the governance structure of that company does not give the partners, the workers, as much control uh, over their labour and over the future of that company, as some people note. And uh, it makes the point, I'm sure Mr Mason will agree, that governance is just as important as ownership. John Mason. Yes, I, I think that was very much the direction I was going in. So um, I am enthusiastic about this, but well, I obviously have to watch both sides. I, I, if I can give a more positive example, perhaps, from my own constituency, uh, members may well have heard of Page Park Architects, who are owned by their 40 or so employees, not a huge uh, business. They are based near Glasgow Green, and have been involved in projects like Scottish Opera, Scottish National Portrait Gallery, Maggie's Centre in Inverness, National Museum of Rural Life. And some of us in the Economy Committee did visit them as part of the gender pay gap study, eh, which we're debating next week, and I have to say I was very impressed by what we heard there. Page Park have what I understand to be a system of indirect ownership. Everybody knows everybody else's salary, and the salaries are structured in a fairly flat system. In good years, if there is a bonus, that is also completely transparent and is shared in proportion to salary. Although, of course, if there were to be a bad year, there's potential for everyone to lose in the same proportion. Uh, I do realise my time is up, but I do again thank Richard Leonard uh, for bringing this subject today. Thank you. I was giving you a little extra, actually, for your intervention, but there you go. Uh, I call Jamie Halker-Johnson, the last speaker in the open debate. Mr Halker-Johnson, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, I'd first like to congratulate Richard Leonard uh, on securing this debate on an issue which is clearly close to his heart. Employee ownership is a concept that can bring support from all sides of this chamber. Uh, Noel Skelton, the former unionist MP for Perth, is best remembered for his advocacy of property-owning democracy in relation to the advances in home ownership and the understanding that this gave individuals a greater stake in society. However, Skelton's central focus was not housing, despite him later covering the topic as a Scottish office minister, but in the status of the worker and his or her stake in the enterprise they were employed in. There's been a long tradition as far back as Adam Smith recognizing the benefits that a more direct involvement in the economic life of a nation for the many will bring. 
Research suggests that workforce well-being can be improved with wider benefits to the business, reductions in absenteeism, reduced staff turnover and attrition, faster growth and greater resilience. Fitting in with the aspirations of both of Scotland's governments, we can look to the evidence that employee ownership can be the potential driver of productivity. And above all, we should see the benefits in terms of people having greater direction over their lives. There are, also, there are of course, different models of employee ownership. There are all sorts of enterprises, large and small, established and innovative startups that have successfully adopted one or other of these models. It is welcome that the Chamber is having the opportunity to consider their successes. In my own region, the Highlands and Islands, there are a number of employee-owned enterprises operating today. As Marie Todd uh, mentioned in her speech, Westside Vets in Shetland used employee ownership to ensure its independence and local focus. Aquascot Salmon uh, Processing in East Ross was part of a management buyout that involved into an employee-owned trust. Highland Home Care in Inverness is now one of Scotland's largest employee-owned companies. Uh, uh, while the well-known West Highland Free Press continues to operate as part of an employee-led publishing cooperative. Other alternative models of ownership are familiar in my region too. The expansion of local community cooperatives has shown that people can maintain essential services within rural areas, harnessing local enthusiasm and local knowledge for the benefit of all. I am pleased that this month's program for government recognized investing, uh, sorry, investigating the scope to expand support to employee ownership as an aspiration. To hear voices across parties speaking up on these issues is a positive step uh, in making progress. In practical terms, other steps have been taken. We know of existing tax relief that incentivise certain employee ownership schemes, and the number of businesses that have taken up such models have increased across the UK. Work has also been undertaken by the UK government follow its commission of the Nuttall Review on Employee Ownership in 2012, including developing a range of information for workers and guidance for businesses who are considering moving towards employee ownership. Last year, the Economy Committee which I now sit on, but in then exchanged correspondence with the Deputy First Minister on employee ownership. In his response, yes. Andy Whiteman. Uh, thank you for taking intervention. Um, I note the Conservatives had a proposal in their manifesto uh, last May to put workers on company boards and to allow uh, workers to uh, hold annual votes on executive pay. Uh, does Mr. Halker Johnson support that and will he be encouraging his colleagues in Westminster to bring forward those proposals in legislative form? Mr. Halker Johnson. I do. Um, sorry, I'm just going to where I am. Yeah. Um, last year, the Economy Committee exchanged correspondence with the Deputy First Minister on employee ownership. In his response, Mr. Swinney indicated that Business Gateway was consistent across Scotland in providing support and advice on alternative business models and that the enterprise ag agencies were appraised of Scotland, Scottish Government's objective to widen models of business ownership with Cooperative Development Scotland taking the lead. One proposal was to enhance Scottish Enterprise Community Development Unit, a remit, particularly in relation to rural areas, noting the comparative success of Highlands Alliance Enterprise in supporting local-led business. It'd be welcome if the Minister could update the Chamber on any changes to the signposting of alternative business ownership within Scottish Enterprise in the ordinary course of its work. The frameworks are clearly in place to enable employee ownership. In many cases, the challenge, as my colleague Dean Lockup mentioned, is simply making businesses aware of that option and giving potential employee-owned startups the support they need to make their business a success. Again, thank Richard Leonard for bringing this to the Chamber. Thank you very much. I call on Paul Wheelhouse to close to the Government. Minister, seven minutes or thereabouts, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and uh, I certainly warmly welcome today's debate, which I think has been a very intelligent debate across the Chamber on the merits of employee ownership. Uh, but during our time in government, we've very much supported cooperative business models, as seen, for example, through the number of employee-owned businesses headquartered in Scotland trebling in the last five years as a result of Cooperative Development Scotland's work, which uh, I'm sure we all uh, share a, a, a pleasure in seeing happen. So this is an important subject and very worthy debate that Richard Leonard has brought forward, and I'm one that I'm very pleased to support today. We have a proud and rich history of cooperation in Scotland, and it uh, forms an important part of our enterprise heritage, uh, which has been referred to by Richard Leonard uh, and other members. Members have made a number of very positive contributions today, and I'll respond to them shortly, and also outline the government's uh, commitment uh, that we have made uh, and continues to make to supporting uh, employee ownership. Now, way back in the middle of the huge social and economic changes that were taking place in the 18th century of, of Scotland, uh, the Fenwick Weaver Society, which has been referred to by Richard Leonard, decided that their best hope for prosperity lay in working together in a properly constituted society. These were workers who recognised the benefits of taking control of the working environment, benefits not just for themselves, of course, but for their families and the wider community. 
Ever since, people around the world have looked to those same principles and examples, and cooperation is now a worldwide movement. We might be a small part of that worldwide movement, but Scotland can and should be proud to stake our claim as being the birthplace of doing business in a better way, a way that puts people first. And I think we all share that uh, intent. Um, now, Richard Leonard, before I move on to other comments uh, from other members, uh, made some uh, obviously very important points in his opening remarks uh, regarding uh, foreign direct investment. I did welcome his clarification, so I'm not going to labour the point, but we do, I think, have opportunities, even with foreign and di direct investors, to work with those companies on the business pledge and other means by which they can take forward the same kind of approaches that would be delivered through employee ownership in terms of workplace innovation, uh, value in the workforce, and trying to gain those same productivity improvements. But I think we are in, in agreement on that, so I'm not going to force the issue. But um, uh, certainly productivity is one of the best defences for companies to protect them from uh, from, from being attacked in, in a market sense. And we warmly support engagement in workforce innovation, with great successes in companies, uh, which I'm sure all members are aware of, such as Michelin and Dundee, uh, where the workforce really took a grip of their future and uh, developed a really successful business model going forward, working with employees to innovate and to drive productivity improvements. Uh, but Marie Todd uh, followed up uh, Richard Leonard's comments with excellent points about sustaining productivity improvements of five to 10% per annum and highlighted also uh, that we can take forward uh, these measures, such as succession planning, well before the retirement of the owners of a business, which is an important point to make. Uh, and regarding uh, the retainment of attaining profitability uh, within the local community, clearly in areas like the Highlands Islands have a, a very dramatic impact in sustaining uh, general prosperity within local economies. Uh, Jackie Bailey also uh, made some sensible points and important points around the uh, employee ownership index and I was fascinated to hear the, the difference in performance between FTSE index and that index which was enlightening indeed. Uh, I appreciate Jackie Bailey is not here presiding officer but for the record since she, she asked me to refer to these points. Um, in terms of cooperative development, Scotland it is a core part of Scottish enterprise now and has, that has ensured that uh, employee ownership is now a core part of Scottish enterprise's succession planning approach, which also addresses, I think, the part that uh, Mr Halko Johnson made and I welcome him to the Chamber the first time I've had to, uh, the opportunity to address him directly. Uh, but this also ensures that account managers have direct access to co-op uh, development Scotland's resources as well, so that hopefully helps answer the points that uh, Jackie Bailey raised. Now, in terms of, uh, I'll try and cover more points as I go forward, but the Scottish Government recognised the importance of uh, employee ownership enterprises and the contribution they make to the growth of our economy and in providing jobs and wealth across Scotland and also in, uh, contributing strongly to uh, inclusive growth. So whilst employee-owned uh, companies in Scotland are not high in number, at 86 at the last count, some are substantial employers, and we should recognise that, as a number of members have done, with a combined turnover of just over 925 million and employing 6,800 staff. Collectively, the sector is important, and crucially, and I want to stress this point, still has the potential to expand much further in future. Uh, Richard Lennon and a number of uh, other colleagues across the chamber have, have made this point and it's highlighted specifically in the, uh, the motion, the examples of Klansman Dynamics and uh, also uh, Nobergrass, Nober Nober sorry, um, which are uh, important companies in Lanarkshire, uh, but other examples have been raised by members across the chamber. Employee-owned businesses are unlike other businesses in a number of other ways, though, in their social purpose, their values, in their governance and in their commitment to their local communities. They are collaborative vehicles that play an important role in creating sustainable and inclusive growth. They enable employees, businesses and communities to work together to fulfil shared interests. And uh, this in turn unlocks creativity and capacity within the workforce, leading to a greater feeling of being valued in the workplace and, uh, and that further locks in uh, productivity improvements. There's growing evidence that use of this model increases productivity, innovation and growth, whilst it's also achieving wider societal benefits to our local communities. And to emphasise again, the models make a positive contribution to inclusive uh, growth. And this is uh, in combination, which is increasingly placing them in the spotlight from an economic development policy perspective. And as a government, the Scottish Government has been and remains committed to encouraging and supporting those who choose the employee-owned business model to drive forward their businesses, helping to deliver our vision of inclusive growth. And by using the term, we speak of growth that combines increased prosperity with greater equality, and that creates opportunities for all and distributes the dividends of increased prosperity fairly uh, within society. Our support is very ably delivered through Cooperative Development Scotland, uh, the Scottish Government's delivery agent, who, working through Scottish Enterprise and Highlands Islands Enterprise, supports company growth through employee ownership business models. Cooperative Development Scotland's ambition is to achieve a tenfold increase in employee ownership in Scotland over the coming 10 years, 
and uh, indeed examples that they have already delivered include uh, companies such as Scott and Fife and Stuart Buchanan garages which between them employ over 240 people which gives an indication of scale of success they are having. There's a generation of businesses now facing a succession problem we know that as the baby boomer generation reaches retirement age many business owners will be considering what will happen to their companies when they choose to take that step back? Starting that process early creates more opportunities, as Marie Todd has indicated. Scottish Enterprise Succession Expert Support provides business owners with advice in the various succession options. Advice and employee ownership is provided as part of this service, and we can see real advantages in it. And for the record, whenever companies get into difficulty uh, and PACE is uh, the Partnership for Action and Continuing Employment is engaged, I quite often raise that as a, is this a solution if a company is in difficulty, could an employee ownership or, or management buyout indeed uh, be an option to take forward? So I, I give a commitment, I will continue to press. It's not always appropriate as, as members will accept, uh, but we do continue to raise it at least as one of the options that we should consider in these situations and see if it's possible to take it forward. There is no doubt that Cooperative Movement and Cooperative Development Scotland are doing a fantastic job and I welcome uh, members' endorsement of that across the chamber. I do think that this is an area where Scotland is particularly strong now and getting stronger, but I take the message we could do even more and I will uh, commit to continuing to keep an eye on how we can do so. With more than 180 businesses having access support over the last five years, a strong pipeline of businesses are seriously considering the employee ownership option. And as a result of uh, CDS's promotional activity, a much larger number of businesses are now being made aware of that model. Uh, so in addition, as members will be aware, in recent months, the Scottish Government has completed phase two of the Enterprise and Skills Review. In uh, undertaking that review, we uh, aim to improve the customer journey for all businesses, uh, including employee-owned businesses, which will be achieved by ensuring the delivery of business support is both clear and we hope in practical terms joined up behind the scenes to hide the wiring to ensure that partners collaborating deeply to support individual businesses are able to do so successfully and with no wrong door when businesses do approach us for support. Work is already underway to put the business user at the centre of our collaborative focus on business support and this will see a move towards a more rounded team approach to companies and their growth ambitions and will include scope to, for, for specialist support where this is appropriate. An approach very much aligned uh, to our can-do framework. The I'm framework, weaving my pen in vain. Can you indeed, point Indeed, so I will, I will come please. to a conclusion quickly. Uh, there are a number of approaches which have been outlined today, which I very much welcome. I do welcome the quality of the, the contributions from across the chamber today, presiding officer. I think it's a good example of how this parliament can operate uh, collaboratively and indeed cooperatively in the context of discussion today. Uh, and uh, we very much support the, the uh, motion in terms of the emphasis that Mr. Leonard has put on uh, engagement in employee ownership companies and I will happily work with any member in this chamber to achieve success in their own areas. Thank you very much. Thank you. That concludes the debate and I suspend this meeting until 2.30.